I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your patience. I know it took us a while for us to let you in the room. You've been waiting so patiently in the waiting room. We appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for being here for our quarantine and stream webinar featuring TK Carter. We had a little technical dif difficulties. Uh, we're still all figuring out Zoom and uh, TK is gonna hop on as soon as he can, when he can. Uh, but for right now, I'm gonna get started with our um, other panelists. My name is Corey Jo Biddle. And I, oh, I think I think we we might have TK on. Wait a minute, we'll bring him on. I had this idea um, for quarantine is in a stream. Watching some of you have conversations on Facebook about what you're watching and recommendations, and I thought it might be cool for us to kind of connect with people locally and with somebody who's in the heart of the entertainment industry in Hollywood to talk about what everyone's watching and how amazing it is that streaming and our ability to watch the same things is still connecting us. So theater and um, music and movies are easily available to all of us and we can kind of watch them as a group even though we're still in isolation. So I'm gonna move forward uh, introducing our panelists, we have Andrea Thompson from The Young Folks and the blog that I know her from is A Reel of One's Own. Hi, Andrea. Hello, nice to, nice to be here. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> we also have Chad Bauman from uh, The Rep. Some of you have, have been watching uh, The Rep's YouTube videos where they're uh, showing some really cool stuff and keeping the love for theater going. Um, remotely and virtually. Hey, Chad. Hey, Corey Joe. Thanks for having us. I'm so glad you could do this with us. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Okay. And we have uh, Dante McFadden. Dante, how you doing? Doing well. How you doing? Good. Dante and I go way back, right? We go okay. way, way back uh, to when uh, he was studying for his PhD. Now he is Dr. Dante McFadden, but he's always been my go-to expert for um, anything uh, cinema or movie related. Um, he's gonna be in the chat room and Q and A, uh, pulling your questions out so that we can make sure the group knows um, what everyone's saying and sharing the information. So thanks again for being here, Dante. Sure, thanks for having me. Okay, I'm gonna start off. I just wanna check in with you guys while we're waiting for, I think TK can hear me. He's trying to, they, he said he can hear me. So I wonder if he came in as a panelist. I'm gonna try to get him on here. But I would love for each of you to kind of uh, check in and tell us how are you doing since we've been um, in isolation. I'll start with you, Dante. You live alone, so what has this experience been like for you? It's been um, quite unique in that I can't necessarily, uh, you know, manage my time the way I normally do because I just think, um, you know, what, what I do full-time at Marquette and what I do part-time with Milwaukee Film, I usually get energy from being able to go uh, choose from a variety of spaces to do my work. And, you know, when you're in a space where you have to do a lot of things and all you see, in my case, is my bedroom, my kitchen, my living room, where we are right now, in my bathroom, um, you know, the, you know, it, 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 it can be challenging. And, you know, sometimes, um, you know, I have to remind myself that, you know, I just got to pace myself um, and realize that, you know, I can't do as much as I normally do, but the key is to try to, you know, get the most, um, the, the high priority responsibilities taken care of. And, you know, I just, you know, I'll just say that um, I've also had to, um, you know, get a humidifier and also an air purifier so that the air doesn't get dry, got to keep the, the window cracked. Um, and, you know, being alone, um, you know, the fortunate thing about it is that I can't get anyone sick and no one can get me sick. 
Mm-hmm. However, um, you know, sometimes you have to, uh, you know, rely on uh, apparatuses like these just to communicate with people and just to check in on people, so on and so forth. But, you know, it'll be nice to be able to, you know, talk to people again. Although, you know, when we go back out again, we may be having something covering our mouths. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Have you had that experience in the grocery store where your mouth is covered and you think you might know the person, but... I didn't realize how much of the whole the whole face you have to see to actually know that you know a person. I'm like, I think I know I know that hair, but I'm not sure. Chad, how about you? How are you? How you been doing? Yeah, I think uh, Dante uh, summed up uh, some of the struggles pretty well. I think uh, for us, we were hosting an exchange student from Germany, and uh, Germany recalled all of their citizens, and so uh, our, uh, our our poor exchange student had to end his program three months early. So. That's been an adjustment for our household. We went from having a teenager in the house to not having any kids in the house. Um, as far as running a company, it's it's uh, you know theater makers are collaborative just by nature, and so not being able to be in the same room with people and still having to make uh, to some degree decisions that are probably um, the most challenging and impactful decisions in our 66 year history has been uh, has been a test. Yeah, I can imagine. You guys have been doing very interesting things. And I have a clip from um, uh, your rep at home and I'm gonna show that a little bit later. Andrea, how about you? How are you doing? Um, I'm very fortunate. Um, I live with I live with my partner, my, my boyfriend, and luckily the job I have for the International Children's Media Center, this nonprofit in Chicago allows me to work from home. So I feel incredibly lucky. Um, I'm. I have a desk schedule since I'm a, since I'm a writer. I'm able to kind of partition off part of my apartment to work, um, and yeah, I'm also not only like still still writing, still pitching. I also run the Film Girl Film Festival, which takes place in Milwaukee. Uh, Milwaukee. Yep. Filmgirlfilm.com still accepting submissions, November 13th through the 15th. So so yes, um, unlike the Twisted Dreams Film Festival. Um, yeah, I was thinking of moving it to March, and so moving history month. So fortunate I didn't. So, so, um, so I just try to stay busy. I try to, I try to read. Just try and, just try and keep in touch with people best I can. Stuff like this, interacting online, just checking in with people, and um, yeah, I've gotten into letter writing. I've gotten like wax, wax seals for the envelopes and everything. So nice. Thank Very you. period piece like of you. I know, right? <laughs> One must keep the drama alive. One must yes, keep we the drama must. Alive. We must. <laughs> we got to keep it moving. So, in my experience with doing these Zoom calls, every every time we do one, something different and unique mm-hmm. happens. <laughs> Before quarantine, it would have been a disaster, and now it's just like, oh well, we'll <laughs> we'll figure it out. So, yeah, I actually, if um, we're gonna get uh, TK on. My, my Facebook, at least so you can see him. I don't know that we'll be able to hear if I'm on FaceTime. You might not be able to hear him, but um, I'll make sure that you guys can see him and he'll wave. So with respect to that, I'm gonna actually just go through and show uh, the same clips from his, um, from his films. And then that'll spark our conversation about entertainment and connecting this and we can start getting into our recommendations. How about that? Sound good? Yeah. Okay. All right. Here we go. So his TK, so TK Carter um, met my boyfriend in LA. So my boyfriend is actually a um, artist in artist management and they just connected out there and just became friends. So as I told you all, I had this idea to do um, this webinar and we just told him about it. Um, and he agreed to help us out with it, which I thought was really cool. So as I start going through, um, looking at all his movies, there's so many movies I couldn't cover all of them. <laughs> there's no way. But I wanted to highlight a couple of them that I know a lot of us would, um, his appearances in film and in movie that a lot of us would identify with. Okay, so the councilman, Councilman Johnson and everyone, everybody hates Chris, hilarious. Uh, it's in the this I love this picture of him from the thing 
Um, so the, the thing, if you guys haven't seen it, it was from uh, 1982. You can still check it out. Who didn't love him as Milo in Saved by the Bell? <laughs> and he actually plays uh, uh, Thelonious, Annalise Keating's uh, brother in um, How to Get Away with Murder. So some of his more recent um, projects here. I'm going to show a short clip from Stumptown here. Let me know if you can't hear me. If you can't hear me, just shake. If you can't hear the audio, just shake your hand. <laughs> but I think you should be able to. So that was one of, I mean, you can see why I couldn't, I could, couldn't possibly cover everything. This is his whole roster of um, filmography and television, just an amazing, amazing career. Um, he's going to talk to us, if I can get him on, uh, about The Way Back, which came out a couple of months ago. And I thought it would be very interesting to kind of discuss um, the fact that this movie was in theaters for a very short period of time and because of the quarantine and isolation went to um, streaming in almost every single uh, platform almost immediately which kind of brings us to what's happening with the film and movie industry the theater industry chad you can kind of speak to um, what's going on in in theater live performance is all about getting dressed up and going to uh, the theater and you guys have done quite a pivot um, in the way that you're bringing entertainment to folks. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've worked in the theater industry for 20 years and I sent out an email right before we shut down our offices and left and I encouraged people to, you know, stay at home and flatten the curve. And it's the first time in my career that I ever remember telling people not to come to the theater, which was a very strange uh, thing for us. Um, and we pivoted pretty quickly. We brought in um, HMS Media from Chicago and had a professional shoot of Eclipse by Dana Garaya at the time, uh, which was the play. And then we started live streaming it out uh, to people in their homes. And it's the first time that we, we had done that and we had to get some major concessions for our unions. And so we had, no, we had to bring the theater or best we could uh, into people's houses. And so uh, we have stuff every single day from Wellness Wednesdays, which is all about mental health to uh, the In the Heights clip, which uh, which you referenced earlier, to monologues that are world premiere about this, um, you know, subject matter that we're streaming out to people, and hundreds of thousands of people have now watched it digitally. Which uh, even just um, a month ago, we would have never have considered to be within the the remit of our mission. Um, so much so that even now, uh, some of the the unions, um, you know, we work with Actors Equity, which is stage actors and SAG after works with film actors that there's union jurisdictional questions um, because you know we have theaters that are working now in film uh, and what, what would have been film so it's been an interesting uh, an interesting pivot and we're we're learning every single day much like you said Corey Joe we have disastrous things that we do we think they're going to go well and they just they just blow up you know um, and then we have some things that that we roll the dice on and, and they go great. Um, and so we have some forgiving people. I think everybody understands we're all trying to do our best. Yep. You know, I, I was at um, the last live performance of Eclipse. We had a fuel event. And I remember, Chad, I remember sitting there and the, the one of the actors came out and told us that we could socially distance. And I remember thinking, really, is that necessary? Like, can you like just think back to that time? I really thought that this was not real and that this was not happening. And I thought, really, that's not necessary. But okay, whatever. So people got up and kind of moved around, and um, the performance was amazing, amazing, and it was emotional and it was jarring for me. And I had so many thoughts. So at the end of the performance, of course, the actors all come out on the stage, and some of the actresses were crying. 
which was not unusual to me given the subject matter of what we were of what of the play but she was she was crying so hard that I remember thinking I wonder what she was crying about like I wonder what was wrong and the next day we got the email that yeah. everything had uh had to shut down and um all the performances so how how did the actors take that you know actors just they are um by nature uh, uh, uh folks that are used to ver adversity just by the nature of their work and shifting quickly you know um but it's hard when every single thing in the country is shut down uh and and you don't know when you're going to go back to employment it's a very very difficult time and so uh, the eclipsed actresses, which were, I would agree with you, phenomenal actresses, um, you know, they, they got paid out of their contracts with us. Um, and so that was the best we could do to take care of them. But we don't know when we're going to be able to reopen and, and provide them work. And there's, you know, 60, 70, 80,000 professional actors in the United States. And that's just in the theater. I'm sure films are doing the same. I'm reading what Tyler Perry is doing, you know, down in Atlanta right now, because their governor is trying to open up and open things back up. And so, it's an interesting world we're living in, but um, yeah, actors have been hit hit pretty hard. Pretty hard. Um, you actually said that your decision to go um, to the rep at home, is, is that what it's called the rep at home, right? Yeah, from uh, home to home, yep. Home to home. That idea actually came from your actors. Yeah, I, that's the, it's the one way that we, we were trying to figure out how to bring content to people, but then also how to keep actors employed. And so by having them create from literally from their living rooms, kind of like exactly where we're all, we're all, you know, coming to, to people from our homes, if we can bring them from their homes to people in, in their homes, hence the name, we could also pay them and uh, keep them employed through this. So I'm going to share my screen again, and I have a short clip from now was in the Heights, the first one that you guys did. It's the first uh, major musical montage that we did. Okay. Let me. The sound should be good on here, so let me know. Hydrants are open, cool breezes flow. The hydrants are open. That and as it goes on, the screen increases, 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 and you see, I'm, I can't, I don't even know. It was like twenty different people <laughs> that recorded separately and came together to put this together. That was amazing. Yeah, it was there. That's the cast of In the Heights that uh, performed at the Rep two years ago, and they broke box office records, and they're now spread out all over the country. Um, and that was sort of their love letter to Milwaukee uh, about how they're thinking of Milwaukee and they appreciate them and. Uh, they, they filmed all of this stuff uh, in their homes and then sent it to a video editor and then put it into a collage. And it was this one number uh, and it was pretty amazing. I was uh, really proud of them. I'm going to, hey, TK. Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm going to show, we're getting very creative here, people. <laughs> Wave to the people. <laughs> Say something. Oh, now I can see. Yeah. Hey, hey, what's going on? How's it going? How's everybody Hello. going? How you doing? Can you guys hear him? Yeah. Thank yeah. you for joining us. I'll put, I'll put my, my old theater voice on. How's everybody doing? <laughs> oh, well, how are you? Good. Fantastic. How's it going? I'm sorry that we're having a technical difficulty. No, how, you... is, how is everything in, in Hollywood? Hollywood? How is uh, How are the streets out there? How's it going? <laughs> Twilight Zone. <laughs> wow. It looks crazy, right? Yes, it looks like it, it looks like the Twilight Zone. So, it's pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. I really don't live in the Hollywood area. I live on the outskirts. I sort of live in the suburbs, man. Um, if you know where the Rose Bowl is in Pasadena, I'm out that way. Yeah. TK, I'm gonna. I, I know I won't be able to keep you on the line like this. Hopefully, if we figure out that link, we'll be able to get you on. But you have connections to Milwaukee. Talk a little bit about you filmed a movie here, and then tell us about uh, uh, the Bronze Fonz. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, um, no, I, no I, I was filming a movie in Chicago. Okay. And, uh, you know, I don't want to date myself <laughs> like Jurassic Park, but I guess, you know, it's a blessing to be in the industry this long. But I, I started in a movie with Dan Aykroyd uh, called Dr. Detroit uh, for Universal Pictures in 1982. And we were in, uh, we were filming in Chicago, the summer in Chicago. And one night, Dan Aykroyd said that he wanted to take uh, the cast to a, a, a blues club in Milwaukee. We went to go see the James Cotton Blues Band at, at, a, at a jazz club, the famous blues club in Milwaukee. It's still there today. I, 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 and uh, yeah, we and they took us through the back door. And we just saw the blues show, and we had a great time, spent a little time there, and then we left. But I remember Milwaukee. Yes, I do remember Milwaukee. So we we talked to you about the the bronze finds that we have on our river walk here, and you and you gave us a funny little story about your uh, Happy Days connection. Yeah, well, back in um, 82, this was 82, I had my own uh, television series for ABC, and I was the lead-in show before Happy Days. And um, we do a lot of press parties and, you know, I met a lot of the people on Happy Days and, and really, you know, got close with Henry Winkler. And then when my show got canceled, their show had been on like four years, they're going on five, six years. My show got canceled 13 dudes in NAACP, somehow got off the air, I won't get into that. But man, I was going through a hard time and I was walking through Westwood, California and I was going to this little donut shop and I ran into Henry Winkler and I was kind of down, you know, I was, I was like, man, forget this Hollywood stuff, forget this, I'm done with it, I'm finished. And he just really sat me down and talked with me and told me, he said, you know, you're very talented, I mean, you know, you, you're a lead in the show and, you know, it's, it's not very easy for someone to hold a show together and things are, you know, not going to always be 100% right in this industry but you got to hang in there and he really just really just like he just like resuscitated me like Henry Winkler is one of the nicest gentlemen in the whole wide world and he's a great person he was nothing like the Fonz I mean you know and he's still going today I think he just got an Emmy for this show called Barry which is on uh HBO but it's amazing because you know I, I, I know a lot of actors but I really a lot of actors, I don't hang around with a bunch of actors. For some reason, my friends are like the guy, who, the plumber or the, you know, the truck driver down the street, the guy who owns the cleaners and stuff. I don't know, because I guess when I got around a bunch of actors, all they talked about was I got a script. I got a script, PK. You know, and I, you know. I guess I, should, I shouldn't pitch my script. <laughs> no, you're cool. You're cool. <laughs> oh, so I can pitch my script then. I'm just kidding. I didn't have a script. <laughs> Andrea, Andrea says she'll pitch her script. <laughs> hey, listen, it, it's you know, it's a, it's a great time for creativity. It's a great time. I think more people right now, this whole thing is like a blessing and a curse. Uh, you know, God bless the souls that are here, man. That that went on with this coronavirus. But you know, if you're sitting in your house and you're quarantined. You know, always keep that pencil and that pad because it's amazing how the creative juices work when you're isolated because, you know, being a writer or a creative person is the loneliest thing in the world. And the only time that you can really create is basically when you're by yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I, I found out that, you know, I, I got some ideas and that I really didn't think I had. But when this quarantine thing came down, hey, I'm writing every day. I'm creating every day, um, trying to support my other friends every day, and I'm just trying to be of service as much as I can because no one really knows what's going on. No one. It, it, you know, it's like everybody's wearing the, the Riddler outfit from Batman with question marks on it. It's like no one knows what's going on. I mean, the, the industry is so in shock right now because we haven't even figured out how are we going to go back on the stage with masks on. You won't be able to tell... Lawrence Fishburne from Denzel or me from Cuba Gooding Jr. You 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 know you, you you're wearing masks you know because it's an industry where everyone is closely close. Uh, you put your you put your makeup on, someone's on you. Uh, you're acting with actors, they're writing their face. Uh, you're with a the crew, there are hundreds of people on the set. 
You got to eat the craft service food. People is handling that. So what are we going to do? No one has figured out. So what do you what do you foresee happening? Like one of the things that I thought was really interesting is the success of films, films that were released during quarantine. Yes. And films that would have gone to theater that went straight to streaming. And I'm wondering if any of that is going to have lasting impact and remain after the isolation is over. I'm, 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 pretty, I'm pretty sure, I'm sure it is. I think sort of the uh, friction is starting now between movie studios and, and the, um, the theaters. Uh, I don't know if you heard that AMC and Universal are added because uh, Universal told um, distributors at AMC that, hey, we're going to release our movies on streaming and at the movie theater at the same time, and the distributors really didn't like that. So I think right now we, we're just seeing the, 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 the beginning of some wars that are probably going to go down as to, you know, how are we going to, you know, put the films in production, complete the films, and then get them on the screen or in you know people's phones or on their computers or on this on their smart tvs we haven't really figured it out i know what i'm going to do i'm going to start taking my talents and i'm going to start streaming my own stuff until they get it figured out Um, people have phones yeah there's a huge appetite for that now i mean we're seeing more and more personalities and celebrities people that you would have never seen facetiming um, or on Instagram. I mean, everybody's kind of stepping in and um, helping keeping folks connected. Yeah, something um, just real quick, um, like, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Carter is like what you're talking about doing streaming your own stuff. Um, a good example that comes to mind is with the Roots. Um, right now, they're on, uh, they have their own YouTube channel and each band member is uh, presenting their own show, you know, doing like anywhere from like five to a half hour's worth of content about, you know, their own uh, tour and stories and things like that. So, you know, I think, um, you know, the, you know, the audience is there and I think a lot of them have uh, become acclimated to it that, you know, you could do something major. You, you know, this is amazing because you get to really find out, you get to really find out how your creative juices are valued, you know? Um, Nowadays, you really don't have to have a lot of talent. Mm-hmm. I started from the theater. Man, I started from the LA Actors Theater. Man, I had to clean toilets and sweep floors and hang up wardrobe and stay at the theater late. And I had to train and act. Nowadays, you just pick up a phone and do something funny in your overnight sensation. Um, I think that that's gonna. I think that's gonna burn out. I think more people right now watching movies in quarantine. I'm watching the old movies. You know, I I watch a lot of old movies. What you been watching? I I watched a a movie called, uh, uh, I think it was Murder at Black Rock, with Spencer Tracy plays a uh, a private detective that goes into a a town and solves a case. And he's an older man, and he stands up to these bullies, and he wins. I watched... um, a movie called Score with Robert De Niro and, and, and uh, Edward Norton. I watched, well, that was a newer movie. I watched, um, this old, was, I forgot, the, oh, oh, Sydney Portier movie. You know, old Sydney Portier movies. That's how I kind of like got into acting, but I watched Sydney <laughs> Portier. And wound up, listen, my mother gave me $5, me and my brother, $5 to go see Lilies of the Field at this little movie theater. We spent $5 to go see Lilies of the Field. <laughs> and years later, I'm having lunch with my manager, and Sidney Poitier is in there, right? Whoa. Sidney Poitier, and I'm, I'm, you know, and I've seen it before, but I really did, I really did, I really did say nothing to him, right? I know what it means. Says I want to tell you that you are a wonderful actor. <laughs> oh, whoa, shoot! People start crying, man. Oh wow! <laughs> Andre had Andre got to cool off after that story. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, hey, let, me, let me tell you what's happening. Well, nineteen. Uh, this one, and this is this. This story is going in my memoir. I write my memoir right now. I'm on, I'm on page ninety-seven. Be patient with me, y'all, because it's coming out. I want to tell you everything because we got a lot to talk about. 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, all right? So in 1979, there was a park called 
on Center Point, Center Park. And this is where a lot of your actors hung out, played basketball, hung out. So these guys are sitting there on the grass, and they're smoking a little weed, right? They're smoking a little weed, and they're passing it around. And Sydney 48 starts walking toward them, right? And so they start seeing Sydney, and they I think I think people can appreciate that right now. TK, so look, I'm gonna let you hop off, but please tell us about um, the way back and your role in that in that film. I've showed them the the, the shot so that they can kind of see where they can um, get access to the movie. So you mean the way gone? The movie was in the movie theaters for two weeks. Corona hit, and they took us out of there. Right. I saw it in theaters if it makes you feel better. I actually saw it. Got to see it before it vanished. Exactly. Um, the father of the star basketball player in that movie, it's a Warner Brothers movie, very good movie directed by Gavin O'Connor, who directed the movie The Accountant. And uh, really, man, you got people have to go see that movie. Uh, it's really, really good movie. It's probably, it was Ben Affleck's movie. Um, it's, 
I wouldn't call it a comeback movie. I would call it a continuation movie after he went through his little situation out there with the rehab and things of that. This movie comes along, and man, I was just so excited to be in the movie and and to work with him. I like working with great actors, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I have no fear. I can. We can see that. <laughs> And we can also see that you're a great actor. And more than that, I love your personality. I think you're an amazing person. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you have plenty of stuff you could be doing, but you stopped in uh, into Milwaukee with us to do this. And I am so grateful. Thank you so much. Hey, we love the people of Milwaukee. God bless y'all. God bless. Right. Take care. We'll, we'll we'll try to get you back on another uh, another call later. We'll figure we'll figure this Zoom thing out. Thank you so much. This worked out though. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was either going to be Zoom or the African drum. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to work it out no matter what. Thank you so much, CK. <laughs> He's great. Andre, you said you saw you saw the movie? Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. I don't care. I'm not a sports fan. I don't care about sports at all. But yeah, and if it could get me to care, it can get anyone to care. Yeah, it, it's but, it's really an excellent movie. The sports scenes are great, and it's cliches. It has a lot of the usual cliches, but because it's a sports movie, but it's it's just an excellent movie. It, it acknowledges it, and I feel it subverts them a little. So, tell us a little bit about um, your. So you, I kind of build you as a movie writer um, here, mm -hmm. and there were so many websites. I didn't know which one which one to pick to talk about you. Tell us a little bit about <laughs> how you got into uh, writing for entertainment and your passion for movies. Um, well, I'd always loved movies. And in college, like I was looking to just, of course, build, build my resume. And I, going to a movie a week is my form of relaxation. And um, so I, back, sites were still kind of pain back then. So I said, hey, I go to a movie a week anyway. Why don't I just write a review? And that's how I got into it. So yeah, I just love movies, love film, because especially now, how we tell stories is so important. Um, like from the beginning of time and like an example, like during the depression, like before we had obviously streaming, even TV, like people would sell their refrigerators before they would sell their radio so they could keep just keep in contact with, ev with everyone and be able to hear those stories people were sharing. So I feel it's important how we tell stories really does shape our reality. Yep. I was just sharing your um, a reel you. of one's own, your blog. How many movies have you covered, do you think? Oh, God. It's, it'd be impossible to, because I don't just, I obviously write essays. Like I um, pretty much every week I do a 52 films by women on my blog. Uh, filmgirlfilm.com. That's my 52 Films by Women column. Um, do you know what the 52 Films by Women challenge is? Nope. <laughs> it's, it's when you make, a, you make a commitment to watch at least one film directed by women a week, so you kind of contribute to female filmmakers and their work. So I try to do that and write about that. And that's partially why I started the film festival, because like, um, the couple friends of mine, I knew the guys who started Twisted Dreams Film Festival. And I thought, if they can do it, why can't I? I want to do more than write about the problem. And that was in 2015 before everything. So, Dante, I want to talk to you a little bit about your uh, background and, and passion for movies. And then tell us what, um, what I know I was just seeing on Facebook that Black Lens, the program, program you um, co-started, co-founded through Milwaukee Film is doing um, a health streaming film for African-Americans. Talk to us a little bit about that. You can start with your origins, your um, sure. movie passion, and then tell us a little bit about Black Lands. Sure, happy to do it. So I got into film mainly, um, you know, during my early, uh, I guess you could say pre-adolescent years. I was really big into watching shows like Siskel and Ebert and at the movies, um, you know, seeing uh, critics uh, talk it out over uh, the films that were out at the time. And then in addition to that, there was Entertainment Weekly. And I guess I was drawn to that because they gave letter grades to you know, all the um, different items that they reviewed, uh, particularly film. 
And, you know, that was just, uh, you know, something that I grew to um, really concentrate on um, in terms of just things that I enjoy, you know, films and then, you know, eventually hip hop music and things like that. Um, when it was time to determine where I wanted to go for college, um, you know, went to uh, UW-Milwaukee, not only because it was the most affordable for me at the time, but they also had a film program. The thing about UW-Milwaukee, um, and this is probably still the case now, is that it's an experimental film focus. So, you know, you had uh, students who were going there to try to, uh, you know, become, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, big time Hollywood filmmakers. Uh, their dreams got crushed uh, when they had to, you know, look at uh, experimental films by people like Maya Darren, Stan uh, Brackage, The Brothers Play, so on and so forth. And for me, you know, I was just open to it, um, you know, just figuring out, um, you know, the different ways in which uh, cinematic storytelling can be done, whether it was done in a linear way or a non-linear way. And, you know, throughout my studies, um, you know, as I progressed through my undergraduate studies and then, you know, transitioning into my master's and PhD uh, programs um, in the English department, you know, I just um, had the passion to, you know, discover, you know, filmmakers throughout the African diaspora. How are they telling uh, peop uh, stories about people from African descent, whether it mirrors something from, um, you know, that you would see in the cineplexes or something that was more linear uh, to something that, um, you know, they tried to tell in other types of traditions, particularly, uh, you know, the griot storytelling tradition um, throughout, um, you know, many, um, you know, ancient African communities, so on and so forth, you know, taking that particular style of filmmaking, something that's not as linear, something that's more open-ended, and then transferring that to um, a contemporary story. And also, you know, just focusing on the, you know, histories of people of African descent um, you know, all across the world through, um, over the course of centuries. So that was something that I was interested in. I ended up landing on what's known as the Los Angeles School of Black Filmmakers, the LA Rebellion, uh, because it was just something that, you know, I had heard about when I was a teenager, people like Charles Burnett, Julie Dash, Holly Garima, when they released their films in the 90s, like To Sleep With Anger, Daughters of Dust, um, Sankofa, and you know, I really, you know, during my master's program and then going into my doctoral program, just really learning more so about the history of how these filmmakers gathered together at UCLA and contributed to each other's work. And I really wanted to use my time in graduate school to contribute to illuminating that history of people. And, and I think, Dante, you definitely have made um, a, a, a mark in Milwaukee in so many different ways, but I... I'm, I shared my screen to show um, the black lens. I mean, this is a an amazing um, arm, basically, of the Milwaukee Film Festival that um, highlights black directors, and you um, had a lot to do with this becoming a reality. Right. So I met Jonathan Jackson, the CEO and artistic director of Milwaukee Film, when we were in um, when we were undergraduates, and you know, also uh, met Gerard Blanks. Um, he was the uh, he founded an organization called Scope, um, which focused on cultural oriented programming. And, you know, he had recruited me to do community outreach. And then when Black Lens, um, you know, got off the ground, you know, I reached out to him to, you know, be a co-programmer with me when Jonathan Jackson introduced that idea to me. Uh, we've been around since 2014. Um, you know, we've had, we're six programs strong, still trying to figure out what we're gonna do uh, for year 2020, um, that's still yet to be determined, obviously. But right now, you can check out the Minority Health Film Series. And that is the brainchild of uh, Gerard and Heidi Moore of Freighter in the Medical College of Wisconsin. So the idea of that came last year. And the goal was to uh, have the Minority Health Film Festival in uh, April of 2019 to coincide with National Minority Health Month which takes place in April, which we're in the last day of, obviously. However, um, that didn't quite work out, but you know, there were still efforts to make this a reality. And so in early, mid-September, that's when uh, the first um, festival of its kind, focusing on health issues concerning um, people of various racial, cultural, and ethnic identities, 
um, as well as having conversations about those issues um, came into fruition. Last year, um, we had people such as um, Harriet Washington, the author of Medical Apartheid. We had Charlemagne the God from uh, The Breakfast Club, and then also Styles P of The Locks. Um, and a lot of the focus was on mental health, but there were other issues that we talked about. Here this April, um, we've been fortunate enough to um, bring this series virtually. Today is the last day to check out a documentary called uh, Mossville, When Great Trees Fall. And it's a documentary directed by Alex Glustrom, who also um, edited and shot it as well. And it focuses on uh, this town called Mossville, Louisiana. And it's about how this was founded by enslaved Africans um, after slavery. And at one point, uh, the town was 8,000 people. And you know these were uh, a community of African Americans who gathered together and built their own homes and built their own livelihoods. And then um, after World War II, you had these petrochemical plants um, start to um, take root in Louisiana around this area. And over time, um, you know, because of the toxic um, elements that come, um, that emerge from that, um, you know, a lot of people um, either um, were forced to move or they got bought out or they were aggressively pushed out, um, you know, over the span of time. And at the forefront of that was um, this company called Sasso, uh, which was um, came out of, uh, based in South Africa. And they were the most aggressive of all into buying out um, residents' homes, properties, and um, even, you know. So you guys are, are you streaming it? People can stream it now? Uh, so today is the last day where you can see it. Okay. Um, and um, it's available through Milwaukee Film Sofa Cinema. Um, if you go to mkefilm.org, as a matter of fact, I can type it in. Um, yeah, type it in the uh, chat and then I'll share it with folks afterwards. And, um, and one last thing I'll say about that is tonight at 6 p.m., there's a community forum you can register for. Just go to the link and um, it takes, um, like I said, it takes place at six o'clock. We got a nice panel. Um, talking about community health um, as it relates to what we're going through now with COVID-19. That's perfect. Perfect. Okay, so with our last few minutes, Chad, I know you got to hop off here soon, so I'm going to come to you. Tell us, what are your recommendations? What are you uh, watching, streaming? Um, what are you yeah, loving? Yeah, so <laughs> I think like, you know, half of America, the Tiger King sort of got me like into these. I was, I was, I've always been an admirer of documentary. And so I, I like document, I read nonfiction. It's sort of, sort of what I do. And yet um, I'm finding that these documentaries about uh, for lack of a crazy, for lack of a, a better descriptor, crazy people, like who are these people? Right. And so in the last week, we, uh, I've also watched finders keepers um, and I watched sour grapes and I've watched McMillions and they're all about these really interesting stories of, uh, unusual people and uh, the storytelling is actually great in all three of them. Do you think Carol Baskins did it? Oh, you know she did it. <laughs> Those tigers were well fed by her husband. <laughs> <laughs> and I never saw the documentary. I didn't watch it, but I totally oh, thank know. thank God. I thought I it was the only one who also hadn't seen it. I just know who she is and I know what she did. I know what you did, Carol. All I gotta <laughs> say is as a gay man from the Midwest, he does not represent my people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chad. Thank you so much for um, being with us. This was so much fun. It was unexpected, yes. like many things today, but it Thank was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Go Love ahead and hop on. Okay. okay. Yeah, okay, when, nice when we can all. get together in person, we'll all do happy hour. Andrea, That's what are you good. watching right now? Oh, well, I recently uh, watched this film that really stuck in my mind called Wild Nights with Emily. It's by, uh, I forget the director's name, but he's, it's about Emily Dickinson, this kind of hidden history and the relationship she had with a uh, sister-in-law who lived right next door. I watched a Never Going Back, um, Augustine Frizzle. That's about these couple of high school dropouts in a small Texas town. It's hilarious. Um, <laughs> I've been watching Gilmore Girls. Um, she were on the Princesses of Power because Katra is awesome. Um, on uh, The Hunt for the Wilder People, the latest Emma, 
and um, The Good Place, um, The Love Witch is fantastic, Blind Spotting, I'm sorry, uh, and um, I keep meaning to rewatch Daughters of the Dust because it is so beautiful and poetic mm -hmm. and influenced just so much. And I really hope uh, Julie Dash uh, make her doc comes out, or maybe I missed it, because she's making another film called Memoirs or Mem Memoirs of a Geishi Girl, I think it's called. Okay. I know she's been making that for a while, and I cannot believe she made that film and never made another. I shouldn't be surprised, but that film. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she didn't make anything theatrically, but she did um, some things for te television. Uh, one of them was The Worlds of the Park Story. Uh, with Angela Bassett in the title role, so that's yeah. worth checking out. That was really yeah. Cool. I know a lot of those, a lot of those uh, filmmakers from the indie filmmakers from the '90s went into TV, but they. Sh that's a whole other rant. It's just and you know what so another rant. Goddamn unfair is the fact that you don't like when death comes to Pemberley. How can you not like that? Oh, where is you where is fun. the wit? Where is? The first time we see Mr. Darcy, he's yelling, where is Elizabeth's famous wit? No. Where is everything? You didn't like where it is... when he told her apologize and she said, I'll do nothing of the kind. Whatever. Yeah. We'll talk about we, it later. We we'll always knew it. Elizabeth had a backbone, but she also had the repartee. Okay. And, she, and right. they did not have that have that wit and chemistry that every that great love stories do. That shouldn't end with marriage. Yeah. I'm obsessed with I'm obsessed with it, and it's several episodes, so if you're on my side, <laughs> watch I it. I am not on your side. I've watched it all, and Wickham and Lydia were the best parts. They were, yes. Now, that was they were true to yes. character. All their traits yes. came out. <laughs> Silly and, uh, and layered, layered, yes. especially Lydia. Dante, what are you watching right now? So um, I'm trying to get caught up on uh, the Showtime series, Black Monday with Don Cheadle and Regina Hall. Um, I'm caught up with uh, the current seasons right now of uh, Insecure, uh, mm -hmm. and then also uh, Killing Eve uh, with uh, Sandra O oh and Julie Coma. Um, it's about uh, you know, this kind of cat and mouse back and forth between uh, an MI6 agent and an assassin. Ooh, nice. And all over the world. I also want to say I've been watching the half of it because I'm going to review that. That comes out on Netflix tomorrow, and it is so fun and enjoyable. This great love triangle, and they casually reference all this art, painting, and philosophy. The half it's of fantastic. it? Fantastic. Yeah. It comes out tomorrow. It's a spin on Cyrano de Bergerac. Awesome. All right. So we're about at our time. I'll give my one recommendation. I cannot stop watching um, the Clark Sisters the first ladies of gospel movie on Lifetime. Ooh. I have been waiting for this movie to come out and it did not disappoint. I love it. I can't stop singing the songs. I can't stop looking up all the sisters <laughs> and they are all alive and well and all over Amazon um, and all over YouTube and Instagram and every platform doing all these interviews because they couldn't have a premiere and they can't do any in-person interviews. So you're going to see even more of them probably than you would have before. And I'm obsessed. If you like music and you like really good acting and true uh, stories, check out the Clark Sisters movie on Lifetime. On my list then. Yes. I got, I got to follow up on that and yeah. the Last Dance uh, documentary series on ESPN. Awesome. Thank you guys so much, Dante. You're amazing. Thank you. And Andrea, thank you so much. We'll be checking out your uh, blogs and following whatever you're watching. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, guys. And thanks for everybody that hung out with us on the uh, thanks webinar for the today. For this. this was not as expected, but you hung with us, and I appreciate all of you. Uh, remember, Fuel is doing live webinars every Tuesday and every Thursday at 2 o'clock. So, Make sure you check the website, www.fuelmilwaukee.org, to see what is coming up next Tuesday. Bye-bye. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.